everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today in today's installment of the Wednesday webinar series. Today's topic is relocation, public housing repositioning tools. My name is Antonella Salmeron, and I am your host for today. Um, before I pass it over to our presenters, I have a few housekeeping items. Our speakers will share the knowledge with us for the first part of the presentation, and we will reserve the remaining time for questions that you might have. You may ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. I will monitor and read the questions, and if we are unable to address all of them, we will send an email reply after the webinar. All webinar participants are muted upon entry. If you would like to notify our team of any technical difficulties, please send us a message in the chat box. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available along with the slide deck on hot exchange in two weeks following today's session. Immediately following the webinar, you will receive an invitation to complete a survey on today's webinar. And we ask that you please complete this with any feedback that you might have for us. Um, just a quick reminder that this is a series uh, in which we have hosted and presented uh, on many topics related to repositioning. Uh, please, please feel free to peruse through the list of recordings and materials that we have on how to exchange. With that, I'll pass it over to Jane. Thank you, Antonella, and welcome everyone. Um, today, our presenters are gonna be, um, and I apologize, but Mr. Will Rudy was going to be joining us. He was He's the director of the CPD relocation program. Um, which does all relocation for uh, CDBG and home and anything else that CPD is getting involved in. Um, he's been called away. They got he, they just got word back on a regulation that he's been working on, and he needed to work on that ASAP. So Jade will tell you more about that in her presentation. And Jade Santoro is going to represent CPD on relocation matters. Um, uh, De Dominique, Dominique Bruce is here from Recapitalization, uh, and she will talk about the RAD program. Kathy Sebist is here from the SAC, um, and we'll be talking more about the different tools that the SAC uh, works with. And then Christine Mortensen, Christina Mortensen is here with Choice Neighborhoods, um, and she will talk about how relocation in Choice Neighborhoods works. Okay, next slide. So um, today, what we're gonna talk about is um, the fundamentals of relocation um, and how the different repositioning tools impact relocation. Um, so in other words, if you're doing, you know, if you're doing a project where you need to move residents, um, depending on what you're doing, you'll have different requirements as to how what you need to offer resident, what the resident rights are, et cetera. Um, so, in it, so we'll talk about the PHA's responsibility to the residents during relocation and what are the residents' rights during relocation. So it'll depend if you're using section 18, um, if you're using um, choice, if you're using RAD, if you're using you know, even temporary cap funds. So we'll talk about all of that for a little bit. So, okay, next slide. So first of all, I wanna talk about what is relocation. Um, and for the most part, when we talk about relocation, we say they're, they, they, somebody has to, you know, your residents are going to have to move from their current unit, either permanently or temporarily. However, when we talk about relocation of public housing, it can also mean relocating or displacement from the public housing program into say a section eight program. So we will we'll, we'll distinguish those two. Um, relocation is really the, uh, the physical act of moving, but you can also be displaced from the, the, the actual program that you're working, the, you know, the section nine program versus section eight. So, Okay, next slide. So providing residents um, or, and understanding their 
rights and their their um, protections is key, and it's something that you need to that we're we're going to cover in a lot more detail. Um, know that. Um, so even if families are not required to necessarily move, they may be staying in the same unit, but they're moving from the Section 9 program to a, a project-based voucher or to a project-based rental assistance program. There's still notices that have to be given. Um, and, and we want to do as minimum disruption, so as much information that you can give residents up front, the better off everyone's going to be. So um, we're going to cover all those today by the different program, by the different tools and different program areas. Um, and I will, will go into those in much more detail in a little bit, but I just want to know that there's different requirements under each program. So we will try to spell that out as quickly or as efficiently as we can for you. Um, okay, next slide. So major things that they, that you, as planning, when you're starting to think about repositioning or changing, you know, doing any kind of major investment on a property, um, keep things to keep in mind as you're doing this and things to consider as you're moving forward is, um, the ability Residents, what residents want are they prefer to stay on the site. This is where they've lived for a long time. They have family, they have community, their church is nearby, their grocery store is close by, whatever. They don't want to go. And so just that's a key consideration as you're doing repositioning. Um, so things to think about is, are there other public housing units available for them? Is there some tenant-based assistance that might be work, be worthwhile? Something, those are all things to consider as part of this relocation. So um, keep those in mind as you're going forward. Um, basically, we want you to consult with your residents as early and as often as feasible um, and making sure that you're not giving them false information, but that you're keeping them informed. Okay, next slide. Okay, so other things to consider as you're going through this will be what funding do you have available for relocation? Now, operating funds and cap funds can be used for relocation. That's something to consider. Um, but also there may be other funding available. Um, what is your capacity? Uh, what kinds of tenant protection vouchers are available? Um, what kind of replacement units are available? And if you are going to relocate residents, can the market support them? Let's say you're going to give them all vouchers and you're going to voucher out. Are there landlords that are going to rent to those people using those, those vouchers? Um, have you set up programs with the different landlords so they know to expect these residents to come. So I'm going to turn the program over to Jade at this point, Jade Santoro. She's with CPD and she's going to tell you about the Uniform Relocation Act. Take it away, Jade. Thanks, Jane, for that gen general introduction to the topic of relocation. And hopefully everyone is thinking about some of those considerations she mentioned. We're going to start today's conversation on relocation talking about the URA. And hopefully most of you have at least heard the term. URA is an acronym for a federal law called the Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property Acquisition Policies Act of 1970 as amended. If you try to say that five times fast, you will know why we use the acronym. This law governs relocation and acquisition of real property across all federal agencies. And because of that, you might sometimes also hear it referred to as the Uniform Act. Again, it's across all federal agencies. Congress created the URA 
to safeguard people whose real property is acquired or who have to move from their homes, businesses, farms, nonprofits, or farms as a result of projects that receive federal funds. Unless a federal program is specifically exempted by Congress, the URA, the URA applies whenever there is an assisted project that includes acquisition, rehabilitation, or demolition. It applies whether or not those particular activities are themselves federally funded. For example, if someone receives HUD funds for new construction, but land was acquired for that new construction project, the URA still applies because we have both federal funding and acquisition, rehab, or demolition. Next slide. If we don't have both federal funding and acquisition, rehab, or demolition, then the URA does not apply. Looking at the programs on the left side of this chart, all types of public housing dollars are federal financial assistance. The question is whether those funds are being used in connection with a project that includes acquisition, rehab, or demolition. Starting at the top, if residents have to move because a housing authority is using capital funds to rehab a building and modernize it, the URA will apply. Note, it wouldn't apply to general routine maintenance that doesn't rise to, to the definition of rehabilitation. If residents have to move because of a fire, a flood, or some other type of emergency situation, the URA won't typically apply to those health and safety moves because they're due to an emergency, not due to an acquisition, rehab, or demolition project. For most HUD projects like RAD or Choice Neighborhoods, you can look at the project budget and if it includes acquisition, rehab, or demolition, the URA probably applies. On the right-hand side of this chart, you'll see some program citations where you can go to find the references to tenant protection rules that apply to these programs, including URA applicability. In the middle of the chart, you'll notice that the Section 18 Demolition Disposition Program, Demo Dispo, is highlighted in red. That's because this program was specifically exempted by Congress from URA. It is currently the only program that is exempted from the URA. I think it re received its exemption because Congress feels like HUD generally does a pretty good job of protecting public housing tenants and Kathy will talk to us later about how HUD does use Section 8 tenant protections to ensure that they're still receiving appropriate benefits and not just being put out on the street. It's important to note that while disposition of a property, you know, we're selling it off, or opting out of a housing assistance contract might cause residents to move, those activities don't trigger the URA unless they're done in conjunction with acquisition, rehabilitation, or demolition. Next slide. When the URA applies, people who sell their property for the federally assisted project are protected from the undue influence of big government. If they're required to sell their property, like when the government is ready to use their eminent domain authority to take that property for, say, a highway project, those sellers are entitled to what we call just compensation. 
the URA provides some very specific rules for how this just compensation amount is established. Fortunately, most acquisitions for HUD projects are between a willing buyer and a willing seller and are not typically subject to eminent domain rules. The URA still protects sellers in these type of willing buyer, willing seller transactions, but the protections are limited to ensuring that the seller understands they're not required to sell and ensures that they're informed of the property's value prior to negotiating the sale. So the person using federal money to buy the property has to tell the seller in advance of negotiating what their property is worth. Next slide. Um, can you back up one slide? We seem to have missed one. Yep, relocation rules. I, I, maybe one got switched before I was watching. Sorry about that. On the relocation side, people who have to move because of a federally assisted project that includes acquisition, rehabilitation, or demolition. I know I sound like a broken record, but it's really important. When people have to move because of these types of projects, they're entitled to URA benefits. And those benefits cover both temporary moves because of the project and permanent moves for the project. On the temporary side, the URA requires that the temporarily occupied housing be decent, safe, and sanitary, and residents have to be reimbursed for all reasonable out-of-pocket expenses that they incur because of the temporary move. This is a very lenient standard. It is not black and white and housing authorities get somewhat confused by it. But the bottom line is you have to treat them reasonably and ensure that it's not making them pay money because you're requiring them to get out while you rehab the building. If temporary relocation lasts longer than 12 months, the URA requires that those residents be offered permanent relocation assistance. They don't have to take it if they want to return to the project. They can remain temporarily housed, but they must be offered permanent relocation assistance at 12 months. When someone is permanently displaced, they're entitled to advisory services, handholding, things like written notices and referral to decent, safe, and sanitary comparable replacement housing, payment of moving expenses, and coverage of increased housing costs for a period of 42 months. I'm pretty sure Congress just threw a dart when they decided it should be 42 months. No rhyme or reason, somewhere between, you know, three and five years, let's make it 42 months. Although not included on this slide, if businesses or nonprofits are displaced, they might also qualify for reestablishment expenses. General public housing transfers for reasons other than a project that includes acquisition, rehab, or demo are not subject to the URA. Relocation under the URA might look a lot like a public housing transfer if you're taking a public housing tenant and offering them a replacement public housing unit, but housing authorities shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that they're one and the same thing. For example, if a housing authority pays for a household to relocate to a replacement public housing unit, and it's subject to the URA, and they're not charging the resident anything for that move, that household still qualifies for what I refer to as an inconvenience moving allowance, which is currently $100 per household. Along that same vein, housing authorities are accustomed to offering tenant-based vouchers to people. But you need to understand 
that the URA requires that voucher to be accompanied by referral to a specific decent, safe, and sanitary dwelling unit where the owner is willing to participate in that voucher program and where the unit is available at the time of displacement. You can't leave it up to the tenant to have to go find that replacement unit. When the project is subject to the URA, the displacing agency is responsible for offering a unit that is available for that person to move to. Now we can go to the next slide. When and how relocation rules apply can depend on the funding used for the project. Many HUD programs contain programmatic definitions for who qualifies as displaced, and a lot of them offer resident protections above and beyond what's offered by the URA. For example, if you add HUD home or community development block grant, CDBG dollars to a project, that can add an additional layer of relocation requirements that we're not gonna talk about today, but we do have training on if you wanna ever go do it, it's on demand. Typically, when you're mixing and matching funding sources, the most stringent relocation rules will apply. But we previously mentioned that Section 18 projects are exempt from the URA. And that is true even if the project includes additional funds that might otherwise be subject to the URA. You do have to look at the actions causing displacement though. What's causing people to have to move? We had one project that was demolishing units using Choice Neighborhoods funds. Choice Neighborhoods funds are subject to the URA. And then they were disposing of those units under section 18. It wasn't the disposition that was causing displacement. It was the choice neighborhoods demolition. In that case, the residents that had to move were having to move because of the demolition and that was occurring under choice neighborhoods. So they were entitled to relocation benefits. It, this project was not exempt under the section 18, even though the disposition was occurring under section 18. It's important to note that the URA generally provides relocation assistance for people who are required to move for the project. And we know HUD likes to complicate matters. We often create these programs that prohibit involuntary displacement. We say you are not allowed to kick your tenants out, but obviously the units might need to be rehabbed. What do you do? You have a rock, you have a hard place. How are you gonna not displace your residents, but you have to have them out because you have to do rehab and you might even be bringing in tax credits and some of those residents will no longer qualify to stay based on the initial program design. There's a very, very fine line between offering a resident an incentive to move out and requiring that they move out. Especially if the program design as written on paper makes it look like some of the tenants aren't eligible to stay in the completed project. In those cases, incentives are okay, but it's extremely important to document that residents understand their right to remain in the completed project. You want to make sure that you have put that information in writing clearly, and usually you want them to sign that they acknowledge that. Documenting that they understand their right to return or remain in the project affects whether or not their displacement is subject to the URA. For additional information, you might wanna check out URA the HUDway training. It's on-demand training. You can take it anytime you want. You can Google it, or we also have it referenced at the end of today's presentation. The RAD program does a good job of ensuring residents are appropriately advised of their rights, even though it has some extremely strong right to return 
rules. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Dominique to talk about the RAD program. Hi, everybody. Um, again, my name is Dominique Bruce. I, I, I work within the Office of Recapitalization or RECAP, um, and we fund the RAD program or the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, for everybody some key points, especially in regarding the resident protections that are provided through not only just RAD, but also you will hear about RAD Section 18 blends. Uh, so those also involve uh, RAD regulations as well. <clears throat> so and one of the most essential resident rights in the RAD program is the right to remain and the right of return, which means that any person who is legally on the lease or otherwise in lawful occupancy at the converting property has a right to remain in or if there will be rehabilitation of the property that will result in the relocation of residents, a right to return to an assisted unit at the property. Uh, with that in mind, residents will return to an assisted properly sized unit, but it may not be the original unit in which they previously resided prior to the conversion to RAD. <clears throat> While residents have the right to return to a converted property post rehab, PHAs may also offer alternative housing options, um, which we often refer to as an AHO. For example, those could be vouchers um, or transfer to other public housing or other converted RAD properties, home ownership opportunities, et cetera, which ensure that residents remain in affordable housing best suited for their household. If the resident who would be precluded from returning objects to such plans, the PHA may must alter the project plans uh, to accommodate the resident's rights to return. What, an example of that would be, say, the housing authority has plans to um, demo and completely dispose of, let's say, like a five-bedroom unit, um, and there's one prop, one household currently occupying that unit. Um, if there are any such plans in post-conversion that would preclude the family from being able to return back to the property, the PHA must alter the project plans and accommodate the resident. Um, so they must speak with the resident directly and, and give not only just that resident, but also the community an opportunity to discuss and plan what the property may look like, especially when accommodating that specific household. Um, for future reference, you can look at the relocation notice section 6.2. And then in the event that residents voluntarily decline their right to return, the PHA must obtain written consent, which is informed through written notification and the provision of counseling. So two requirements, just to highlight again. So <clears throat> the decision on whether or not to return back to the property, uh, it must be voluntary which requires that the resident is not pressured to make a decision and has at least 30 days to do so, depending on the type of relocation. Um, and then second, documented. So requiring the PHA to retain evidence, written evidence that the resident was informed in writing of their rights regarding the RAD conversion, their right to return to the property as well. They re The resident received housing counseling and that the PHA um, has communicated with the resident and the resident has communicated their final decision again in writing as well. Um, a conversion cannot be the basis for an eviction or loss of rental assistance. Um, so you cannot just kick residents out um, simply because you are planning on participating in the RAD conversion pr pr process. Um, <clears throat> you need to have a valid reason for that resident. So it needs to be something like a lease violation. You cannot just plan to dispose of all occupancy within the property prior to conversion just because it'll make the process a little bit easier <laughs> with a relocation. Um, <clears throat> something also important to know is no rescreening. What that means is Whatever residents are, again, lawfully occupying the units prior to conversion, um, which we determine that 
whatever residents are residing in the property um, before, well, after the issuance of the CHAP, which is the contract for housing assistance payment, which is, is one of the very early steps within the RAV conversion process. Um, so any resident residing within the property after that issuance of the CHAP um, has that right to return um, and right to remain at the property. And then they are also precluded from any rescreening. So if there is any combination of, let's say, LIHTC, low-income housing tax credit funds, um, and you have to meet certain standards to be eligible as a LIHTC resident, the residents can be screened for LIHTC eligibility um, and they can be, you know, they may not qualify for the LIHTC. However, that does not preclude their right to remain um, or return back to the property under the underneath their rights through the RAD conversion program. So, and then another highlight is transfer of assistance, um, which would be transferring some units to possibly another site. Uh, so transferring the affordability to another site or to another unit. Um, and a transfer assistance, which we often refer to as a TOA, may require the owner to issue a GIN notice, a general information notice to any residents of the receiving site because the transfer of assistance means that the receiving site is now going to be receiving federal funds. Um, for more information, you can check out our RAD fact sheet, number nine, RAD and relocation. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide. Thank you so much. So um, I wanted to be able to provide some updates as well. In July of 2023, we just released a new supplemental notice to the 2016 RAD regulation notice. Um, we call this notice RAD Supplemental Notice 4-B 2023, or you're all, you'll often hear us just say the 2023 Supplemental Notice. Um, some key changes with this new regulation that we just passed and it became effective in totality by the end of September of 2023 um, is that prior to application, there is now a requirement for two resident meetings within six months of the application uh, submission. So what that means is if you are intending to submit an application for RAD conversion to the Office of Recapitalization, you are required as a PHA to meet with your residents at least twice uh, minimum within the six months of you submitting your application. We have had instances before where uh, getting to the actual application submission phase has taken a little bit of time. And so it may have been more than one year, um, more than six months um, since the PHA held their initial two meetings with the residents. Um, in those instances, you do need to post an, an additional two meetings with residents uh, prior to submitting your application. Um, and then there are some other special circumstances in which you may not have to have those um, another a, an additional two meetings. Um, and please feel free to contact me in our office um, and we can work with you one on one in those instances. Um, another key point is that at the actual RAD application, um, you must submit a relocation plan um, and at minimum, if you do not plan to relocate the residents for a period more than 12 months, um, you at least need to submit a short summary statement of what your plans are for the relocation. If it is temporary, um, beyond 12 months, that is considered permanent relocation and you do need, there are additional documentation requirements that you need to submit to us in those instances. And then at CHAP issuance, um, you need to start a resident log and then also issue a resident information notice or a RIN. And then after RCC, um, no relocation can take place until after RCC. There are some special circumstances where early relocation can be approved um, if you need to relocate residents prior to the issuance of the RCC. Um, however, um, generally, 
no relocation occurs until after the RCC, which is the RAD conversion commitment, um, which is the final contract prior to closing between the PHA, uh, whatever development partners and HUD itself. And so after issuance of the RCC, uh, you must issue a GIN notice, a general information notice to anyone who must move, um, and then also issue a 90-day notice for all permanent relocation as well. And then again, for early relocation prior to RCC, uh, you can move residents with HUD approval, express written approval. Um, if relocation is necessary in order for repairs to be completed at the project, a resident may need to be relocated to temporary housing. Uh, relocation cannot begin again until HUD approves the financing plan and issues the RCC. And before a PHA can proceed with relocation plans, they must provide residents with the GIN. Um, so again, just really hammering that information in um, with the notice requirements. And we extensively highlighted that in our 2023 supplemental notice um, as far as notification and documentation requirements. Um, in the GIN notice, it must include an overview of resident rights under RAD and the URA, and then also information regarding a resident's right to return, relocation assistance, and information regarding any sort of displacement. If a resident will be relocated, they must be notified at least 90 days in advance for permanent relocation and 30-day notice for temporary relocation. And then temporary housing must be affordable, decent, safe, and sanitary. Residents must be reimbursed for out-of-pocket expenses incurred during relocation, which includes moving expenses, Increase housing costs and meals if the unit does not have cooking facilities. And then if the relocation extends beyond 12 months, the resident is considered permanently displaced for purposes of URA protection, um, which includes permanent relocation assistance. Um, and again, for early re relocation, um, the PHA and owner may not initiate involuntary physical relocation until both the RCC is in effect and the applicable RAD notice of relocation period has expired and neither involuntary nor voluntary relocation for the project shall take place prior to the date, effective date of the RCC. Again, just really hammering that in. Early relocation is possible, but you must take the appropriate steps to get that approved. Um, and then reasonable advance notice shall be 15% of the resident's temporary relocation or 90 days, whichever is less. And then for post-conversion rights, resident rent is phased in. Um, residents still pay 30% of their income. And if there is any sort of increase or discrepancy between what they were pay paying prior to conversion, um, that will be phased in post-conversion. And then also continued participation and resident self-sufficiency programs. Residents also have participant participation rights and funding through tenant organizing. And then termination and grievance procedural rights do continue post RAD conversion is what those rights look like are just dependent on whatever funding source the their unit will be underneath post conversion and residents also have the right of choice mobility um, as well through RAD conversion. Um, and the requirements for those are either one year or two years, depending again on whatever funding source their household will be under post-conversion. The, again, the PHA must maintain a resident log for all impacted residents, which must be provided to HUD upon request. And the entity, either the PHA or their owner, with primary responsibility for managing the resident's relocation. Um, the address of the residence, uh, assigned unit in the covered project, and if different from the resident's original unit, information regarding the size and amenities of the unit post-conversion as well. So all of this information must be included within that resident log. Um, and then also the date of the resident's return to the covered project post-conversion and that the PHA or project owner will be reimburse the resident for all reasonable out-of-pocket expenses if the PHA or project owner does not decide to just pay those costs upfront themselves. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kathy. 
Thank you, Dominique. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start out with Section 18 and some of the key resident protections with this program. Um, as Jade mentioned, it is not subject to the URA, um, but the statute itself does include um, a relocation section um, that PHAs must comply with. So, sorry, Kathy, I'm just going to interrupt for one second. So this is the main difference between URA and Section 18. Section 18 comes with TPVs. So, okay, Kathy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the first key point I'd like to make is that um, the PHA must provide a 90-day notice to all residents affected by the demolition or disposition. So the key point here is all residents, even if they're not physically displaced um, or required to move off site, are entitled to the 90-day notice. Um, they're entitled to be notified that their public housing unit has been approved for demolition or disposition and that things like their public housing protections are going to end. Grievance, organizing, flat rent if applicable. Again, even if not required to physically leave their units. Um, further. Another protection here related to the 90-day notice is that the PHA can't issue that 90-day notice until after SAC approves the application, unless there is an imminent health or safety issue. Um, if you have a, a closing deadline and, and that 90-day notice period is going to be an issue for your housing authority, um, you can request that the residents provide um, their voluntary consent to um, like accept a, a PBV lease, for instance, um, without that full 90 days um, occurring. Um, second key point here for resident protections under section 18 is the forms of comparable housing. So he, listed on this slide, you are, are the key three forms of, of um, comparable housing that PHAs typically offer. There's pu other public housing units if you have them available in your inventory. There's HCV assistance, uh, housing choice voucher section eight assistance. And that could come in the form of tenant-based or project-based. Um, and there, if available, you can also relocate to a PBRA unit or a RAD PBRA unit, for instance. Um, and then the third kind is a unit um, occupied or assisted by a PHA at a comparable rental rate. Um, the most typical form of comparable housing that PHAs offer is um, Section 8 assistance, um, HCV assistance. And to help with this, the PHA may be eligible to receive, as Jane just mentioned, tenant protection vouchers, commonly known as TPVs. I'm not going to get into the details of TPVs at today's presentation, but there's an excellent FAQ on TPVs and repositioning linked to in the resource slide. Um, I do, however, want to do a quick high-level interview overview of TPVs. Um, TPVs, they're a new award of HCV assistance that Congress authorizes through annual appropriations. Uh, they generally function as regular HCVs or tenant-based assistance. The family must income qualify, and to the family, there's generally no difference between a TPV or a normal HCV. For instance, although residents typically want to stay in the area when they're impacted by a demo or dispo, they can pour out their TPVs to other uh localities or even states. Um, for, the T, for the PHA, the biggest distinction between TPVs and normal HCV is that they are special admission vouchers. So income targeting and admin plan preferences do not apply. Uh, and the SAC approval authorizes a maximum number of TPVs that the PHA is eligible to receive. But note that the PHA must apply separately to HUD through the field office for those TPVs after SAC issues the approval. TPVs are not automatically issued. Um, another thing I wanna mention briefly is when a, um, a housing authority has an over-income family, someone who is 80% or higher uh, AMI, as I just mentioned, they don't qualify for Section 8 assistance as the form of comparable housing. 
Um, we typically see housing authorities offering these over-income families other public housing units if they have them available. But increasingly, a lot of housing authorities don't have public housing units available. Maybe they're removing the last of their public housing units with the disposition application, for instance. In that case, the PHA um, still needs to offer comparable housing. And in this instance, it will be that last kind of bullet on the slide, a unit um, operated or assisted by a PHA at a comparable rental rate. There's considerable PHA discretion here um, in terms of the length of time that the um, housing authority would subsidize the rent. Um, we sometimes see housing authorities, if the project will be used as housing after the disposition, to allow that over-income family to stay in their unit, um, paying either market rent or 30% of their income. Um, and even if they're PVVing the project, they can uh, exclude that particular unit from HAP. So that is one option we sometimes see. Um, third key point here I'd like to stress is that the PHA, like with all the other programs, the PHA is responsible for paying the relocation expenses uh, for the families. Again, PHAs have discretion to determine what expenses are actual and reasonable based on local circumstances and housing conditions. Um, unlike URA, there's no mandated um, uh, amounts of, of, of money that the housing authority needs to provide or, or, or mandated requirements um, for paying moving expenses. Uh, the, the terms that the statute uses, again, are actual and reasonable. Um, so this could include paying for security deposits, pet deposits, landlord incentives, and other expenses that the housing authority feels are actual and reasonable in addition to packing up the boxes and moving. Um, and what's really kind of neat about this is a PHA has discretion to pay for those expenses as part of a Section 18 relocation, even if those uh, expenses are not allowed by, say, Section 8 admin fees under the normal HCV program. Um, and as I previously indicated, porting out a voucher is allowed, um, but let's give an example that a resident lives in Alabama and is in a project being um, approved for demolition or disposition, and they want to take their voucher, uh, their tenant protection voucher, and port out and move to Hawaii. Well, in that instance, a PHA may determine that those moving expenses from Alabama to Hawaii are not reasonable, and they don't have to pay um, that whole um, move, uh, cross-country move like that. Um, in terms of funds for relocation, um, as I think most of you probably know, Section 18 applications are unfunded. So they don't come with any new funds to help the PHAs uh, relocate the families. Um, unlike say choice where grant funds can be used for relocation. So we typically see PHAs using their capital funds to pay for relocation. Um, uh, we often also, also see PHAs being able to negotiate with a developer if, if they're turning the project over to say a tax credit entity for redevelopment that the relocation expenses would come from the development budget so they don't have to use their precious cap funds. Um, another great source of funds for relocation are gross disposition proceeds. So if you have structured the disposition and that you're actually going to realize proceeds, um, you can use those proceeds to pay for the relocation. Um, one quick note here, if a PHA is going to redevelop a project and initially is, is vouchering out the families with tenant-based assistance, and later offering them the opportunity to return to the site. Um, and it wants to pay those moving expenses back to the site. It, at that point, it cannot use CAP funds or 1937 Act funds. Those funds to relocate the family back to the site um, would need to come from the development budget or other non-federal funds. Um, and then the, the fifth key point I want to stress here with resident protections is the PHA must provide families with necessary counseling and advising. So again, lots of PHA discretion. Um, it could be and often is mobility counseling, but the family might need other kinds of counseling too. So the family has to provide the families with any counseling they need um, related to the uh, displacement or relocation. Um, okay, next slide.
the slide just outlines um, kind of the, the chronology for uh, the requirements with relocation with a Section 18 application. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd like to emphasize is that it, PHAs are required to consult residents and local governments about their um, intent to submit a Section 18 application. Um, and they have flexibility how to consult and exactly what to consult on, but we highly encourage PHAs to consult directly on the relocation um, planning and, and, and what it has in mind, whether families will be offered the opportunity to move off site or only offered um, units, um, their own units as PBV, just get into those details so that residents are well aware um, prior to the application submission. Um, uh, at the application stage, the PHA submits a relocation plan to the SAC. I say that in, in bunny ear quotes um, because they PHAs may, but are not required to submit an actual written uh, relocation plan uploaded to their DDA SAC application. Um, we often see that and it's great if PHAs have it on record to share with residents and, and other stakeholders, but what the SAC requires at a minimum is certain information about the relocation plan as part of the HUD 52860. Um, after SAC approval, um, in terms of the, 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 the flow of steps a PHA typically takes, is if they're interested in applying for the TPVs that the SAC uh, approval has authorized, then they, again, submit that separate application to the field office to apply for those TPVs. Um, and then they can issue the 90-day notice to families when they're, when they're ready to do so anytime after SAC approval, and then they provide the necessary counseling um, and, and assist the, the, the families with getting whatever form of comparable housing they're offering. And then before the demolition or disposition can occur, so before demolition can commence or disposition can be completed, meaning going to closing or having had release a DOT, is the housing authority needs to have actually relocated all families. So the statute directly says that if, if the housing authority is issuing tenant-based assistance as comparable housing, that family must actually be leased up so they can't just give them a piece of paper and say, here's your voucher, and in 90 days, we're disposing of the property. So if they were unable to find a unit within that 90-day initial search period, the housing authority has to keep trying, provide more mobility counseling, or offer another form of comparable housing, um, such as another public housing unit. Um, and if the housing authority is um, planning on PBVing all of the units and, um, or offering the families the ability to stay in place with tenant-based assistance, then there's a, a slight timing issue. And we usually say that the relocation and the disposition can occur pretty much simultaneously. And, and what happens in practice is um, on day one, the housing authority EOPs puts the public housing families in end of participation status and pick. And then the next day HUD releases a DOT, you go to closing, and those families are moved under, under Section 8 um, program through the 50058. Okay, next slide. Okay, we're gonna move on to Section 22 voluntary conversion. Um, a lot of what I said about Section 18 and the resident protections there apply to Section 22 voluntary conversion. Um, the relocation expenses, actual and reasonable, same as Section 18. TPV process, pretty much the same as Section 18. Um, I will point out a couple unique tenant protections in Section 22. Um, and Section 22 includes regular voluntary conversion and streamlined voluntary conversion under PIH Notice 2019-05. So the first really unique thing is the PHA is required Required to offer tenant-based mobility, uh, a, a tenant-based mobility option to the residents. So unlike Section 18, the Housing Authority cannot offer residents only their PBV, uh, only a PBV lease in their existing units. They need to offer a tenant-based option. 
Um, in addition, if the project is used as housing after conversion, then the residents have the right to remain in their units with tenant-based assistance. So um, tenant consent is required in order for the housing authority to project base voucher their unit. Again, not required in section 18, but it is required in section 22. So basically if a project will, um, will not be used as housing after conversion, then the housing authority must offer the families tenant-based assistance to move off site. If the project will be used as housing after conversion, then the housing authority must offer at least two things. Must offer the families the ability to move off site again with tenant-based assistance. And it must also offer the families the ability to remain in their units using tenant-based assistance. And then in addition, the housing authority may, but is not required um, to offer the families the ability to remain in their units under a PBV lease. But again, that requires written tenant consent. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll end uh, section 22 with, with two things. One is that the URA may apply. So refer back to the, the, the terms that Jade emphasized many times. Um, demolition, acquisition, or rehab. If there's any of those triggers as part of the Section 22 plan, then URA may apply. Um, if, if not, then uh, Section 22 comes with its own relocation requirements, again, very similar to Section 18. And then last thing I'll point out with Section 22 in resident protections is I... I like this language in section 22 and the 972 reg, which isn't in section 18. And it says that the housing authority um, must relocate families to decent, safe, sanitary and affordable housing. That is to the maximum extent possible housing of their choice. So, uh, you know, Congress had in mind that the housing authorities should should try to accommodate resident preferences in terms of whether, whether they wanna stay on site or move and where they wanna move. So uh, I just think that's important to keep in mind with section 22. Um, okay, next slide. Um, again, this is the application chronology and uh, timing um, for, for how this works. Um, it, again, it's very similar to what I covered in section 18. The biggest distinction here is if um, voluntary conversion is, is, is subject to the URA, then the written notice um, shall be provided to families no later than the date the conversion plan is submitted to HUD. So again, with section 18, I really honed in on that 90 day notice can't be uh, provided to residents until after SAC approval. Same is true with section 22, if URA is not triggered. If URA is triggered, then the, the initial notice to the families has to be provided when the conversion plan or application is submitted to HUD. Um, I think that's, that's it there. So let's move on to home ownership. Next slide, please. Um, I think we missed one. There we go. Um, so key, pres key resident protections with home ownership. Uh, this is section 32 of the 1937 Act. For non-purchasing residents, the protections are very similar to section 18 um, in terms of the 90 day notice, offer of comparable housing, actual and reasonable relocation expenses. So I'm not gonna get into those protections again here. Um, what I wanna talk about for just a minute are the resident protections in 32 um, for residents who are interested in purchasing their homes. In this instance, all uh, families that are currently occupying a unit are, are provided with a right of first refusal to purchase their home. And the really neat thing here is this also applies to over income families. So if you have a family that's 80%, above 80% of their income, um, and living in say a single family, a public housing unit somewhere, um, 
and that family might be in a better financial position to actually purchase, you that family gets um, a right of first refusal to purchase the home. So um, if, if your housing authority is in that kind of unique situation where you have over income families living in single family homes, I uh, highly encourage you to look at um, home ownership in section 32 to give those families the ability to purchase. Um, and another great resident protection in section 32 is that a PHA can um, couple the Section 32 program with the Section 8Y home ownership program. Um, and they can actually use the new allocation of tenant protection vouchers that they'd be eligible to receive to attach their 8Y home ownership program to. So this, again, using these two HUD uh, 1937 Act home ownership programs together might make it more feasible for a housing authority to allow its public housing families and other low-income families in the community to purchase those homes. Um, okay, next slide. Um, again, very similar to the to the other chronology, so I'm not going to spend um, really any time on this one. But um, you know, definitely consult the families about. Uh, the, when you consult the families about the home ownership plan, talk about relocation, talk about the right of first refusal, maybe get a, a sense of how many families are interested in purchasing versus non-purchasing residents who would be entitled to the comparable housing. Um, and I think that wraps it up for me and I'm going to hand it over to Christina to uh, talk to you about choice neighborhoods. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Again, this is Christina Mortensen. I'm with the Choice Neighborhoods team in the Office of Public Housing Investments at HUD. And for anybody that needs a, a quick primer, Choice Neighborhoods offers grants up to $50 million, uh, most commonly awarded to public housing authorities and cities for the replacement of severely distressed public housing units into new mixed income housing that includes both HUD supported and non HUD supported market rate units, tax credit units uh, in a new community. So what this means is that typically residents are relocated so that a property may be demolished. Aha, Jade, there's our URA connection. And new units are built typically back on the site. Um, so all of those requirements you've been hearing about with URA do indeed apply uh, to choice neighborhoods. Choice Neighborhoods plans can vary widely um, from city to city. Uh, relocation and development often phased. Uh, sometimes you have offsite phases that give residents an opportunity to move once into a new unit. Um, new units can be public housing, they can be Section 8, they can be RAD, they can be Section 8 without RAD. I tell you that because there's a lot of nuance that can affect a Choice Neighborhoods plan and some of the more uh, complicated particulars from relocation. So I'm going to stay a little high level on this slide and talk about the program's design and how it's intended to support residents, resident choices, and go beyond the Uniform Relocation Act. So first and foremost, uh, looking ahead to any new developments, um, all original residents have a right to return um, to a new unit within the new community. For the purpose of choice neighborhoods, what that means is those residents that were living at the site, uh, the public housing site, the day that the grant was awarded, they're under lease, they stay under lease until relocation, have that first right to come back to those new units. So that lease compliance is really important to choice neighborhoods and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in order to come back to a site, uh, choice neighborhoods requires all of the units to be replaced on a one for one basis. And the housing plan needs to be responsive to resident needs. So if residents are in a two bedroom, but need a three, that housing plan should have those bedrooms, those units available for them, they should be properly sized, the plan should be responsive. A really unique nuance to choice neighborhoods is that all households must be offered a tenant-based voucher. And that needs to happen upfront with relocation. 
HUD provides PHAs with new voucher assistance, tenant protection vouchers to accommodate this. And this can include uh, new relocation vouchers and RAD transactions. Residents can maintain this voucher assistance. There's no requirement uh, that a resident comes back to the site. Um, and for those residents that indeed take the voucher, um, there needs to be a concerted effort from PHAs and partners to make sure that residents have every opportunity to use that voucher to access uh, housing in high opportunity areas. There's a real expectation here um, through Choice Neighborhoods that there's a support team in place that helps residents before, during, after relocation. They're helping residents understand their options up front um, so that they can make the decision that's best for them, whether it is a unit at the new property, whether it is a tenant-based voucher to go to a place if they're choosing or not here on this slide, comparable housing maybe at another public housing property. That's really one of the choices in choice neighborhoods. It's about resident choices to make the decision on what's best for them um, in terms of where they would like to live, what their preference is. That requires robust mobility counseling, um, again, before, during, and after that relocation period. And that's in addition to supportive services that Choice Neighborhoods grants can also provide um, to help residents get new jobs, access education programming, access health programming. So there's a team in place uh, that is assigned on a household level basis to support residents through and through this process. terms of relocation and return, um, relocation from the site is required, including that mobility counseling, including reasonable moving expenses, including security deposits, um, but unique to choice neighborhoods since the goal is to see residents return should they choose, um, is that there should also be the supports in place to make sure that can happen, that barriers are eliminated, uh, which means grant funds may also be used to support the cost associated with returning to the site. Throughout, residents are tracked. PHAs are required to track residents for a period of five years. Um, after the initial move, and they are also required to report to HUD um, relocation, how many folks are moving, also where they're going, um, and reoccupancy metrics. Are they coming back, or are they choosing to take those vouchers, or are they leaving HUD assistance? Um, so all of that is tracked throughout the life of the grant. I know it's in the resources slide, which you'll see, but there's also a link here uh, on our website. There's a, a lengthy document that outlines uh, the Choice Neighborhoods requirements, uh, whether it's through those URA notices, but also some best practices um, in terms of mobility counseling and other expectations to ensure that residents are supported through this process. So that's the high level. Let's go to the next slide, Antonella, and dig a little deeper. Uh, We've broken this out uh, to do a before and after the grant award, as well as the bonus after housing development is completed uh, because choice neighborhoods, you know, development schedules may vary for new housing. It affects relocation schedules. Sometimes there's phases before grant. So this was the way that we went. And with the before um, the grant award, there are some early expectations um, before a PHA even applies to choice neighborhoods. You know, first and foremost, there's the absolute expectation that residents are significantly involved in the development of a transformation plan. So residents are giving input on not only what the new housing will look like, supports that they need, but there should also be resident involvement in the creation of a relocation strategy. That's upfront. To HUD, a PHAs must certify that they've had at least two resident meetings before submitting an application to HUD for Choice Neighborhoods funding, as well as additional public meetings. Uh, one of the meetings needs to be after HUD's funding cycle opens so that residents really clearly understand that a PHA is requesting this money from HUD that may ultimately lead to the displacement and demolition. 
that certification that's made to HUD is articulating that a PEJ has discussed relocation, relocation assistance, URA, reasonable accommodations, reoccupancy, right to return. And this is a threshold. So what that means for the purposes of application review is that PHAs must do this. They must certify that they've done this. Absent that, a grant cannot be awarded. So that early upfront conversation with residents is required and important. Applications for Choice Neighborhoods fundings also go on to describe a relocation plan, a mobility plan, the larger resident support strategies, um, how they'll communicate with property managers, how um, PEJs will work to ensure housing stability and prevent evictions, ensure vouchers are used in high opportunity areas. The better the plan, the more points an application can earn, which means the more likely it is to get the big $50 million. So those PHAs that are best prepared uh, with the best thought out strategies are more likely to succeed to get this money to proceed with redevelopment. Beyond that, of course, applicants and subsequently grantees should consider how redevelopment affects residents. This is what Jane talked about. There should be really careful consideration to minimize any disruption, any adverse impacts that may come uh, from the relocation and vitalization. Thinking about things like the timing of relocation and how that affects the school year. Um, those are things that we would expect grantees, PHAs, to be thinking about upfront before Choice Neighborhoods funds are even awarded. Um, after an application is submitted, uh, grantees or applicants still at that time are expected to provide residents with the general information notice that's required through URA, informing residents that uh, relocation may be expected and share any update plan with them in terms of the timing and how relocation will generally work. So that's upfront. Post-award, post-grant. Okay, PHA has got the money, now what happens? Um, those grantees must continue to apply with URA, whether it's the notices, the benefits, um, throughout the development, which again may be phased. Grantees will go on to finalize the relocation plan, which has moved from that general sense to now really getting into the details of incorporating feedback they've heard from residents, clearly outlining the schedule, relocation assistance, individual supports, how they'll notify residents of what's coming, um, how they'll notify residents of what's coming back when new units come online, uh, identifying comparable units, uh, really spelling all of that out uh, in great detail different for choice neighborhoods since there's the expectation and hope um, that residents have that right to return. They choose to take it and come back to the new site. Um, grantees should also be thinking about a reoccupancy strategy. Who gets the first call to come back? What's the priority if you've only got 30 units coming online, but there's 100 that have been relocated? working through those issues, working through how you'll how far in advance you'll notify residents of units coming back online. So we talk a lot about a relocation plan, but in Choice Neighborhoods, we also need to talk about a reoccupancy plan for those that are choosing to come back. PHEs will work with the Choice Neighborhoods team to apply for and access tenant protection vouchers, is what Kathy was talking about. And again, grantees have the absolute responsibility to ensure that vouchers uh, or voucher holders have a real opportunity to use them in a high opportunity area. So as part of the mobility counseling, um, there needs to be, again, that dedicated team in place to helping a resident through and through. We expect um, grantees to have strategies on recruiting landlords to participate in the Section 8 program um, to encourage more demand locally, identify those comparable units, provide transportation to, to visit units, um, assist in completing paperwork, providing information on portability, fair housing, all of those things are expected to be done upfront. 
And to assure that this happens, again, grant funds may be used for moving costs, security deposits, utility connections, those landlord incentives, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that those voucher holders have a real chance to succeed in any neighborhood that they're choosing to move to. This also requires, and this isn't on the slide, but it does require that residents are assessed on their relocation and return preferences. And again, that support team that's in place should be making sure that that's happening. Uh, that team is critical um, throughout. So that's PHAs, often relocation specialists, case managers, they're collaborating, their supports are individualized, they're tailored to specific families. There's the real expectation that they're meeting with families regularly, helping them understand schedules and what to expect. Um, but also after a move, making sure that residents are successful in their transition to new housing and new neighborhoods, identifying any barriers that they may have and addressing them. And this is really key because you heard talk about the right to return. Residents need to stay least compliant. So that emphasis on success no matter where they go is important. And Choice Neighborhoods emphasizes housing stability, eviction prevention throughout so that residents maintain that right to return. So that's carefully tracked um, by HUD to make sure that that happens. And that requires a couple things. Um, Hopefully, uh, property managers are meeting regularly with case management staff, with relocation staff. Uh, HUD asks through Choice Neighborhoods to have a early warning system um, to prevent eviction. So if a resident's behind on payments, um, if there's any sort of disruption at the site, that it's identified up front and there's a proactive team in place to work through any challenges that there may be. Um, again, informing residents of their rights, informing them of their supports, and that's matched with those case management services um, that residents are receiving. All of this, all of the relocation and mobility counseling should be happening for about three years after um, initial relocation, but the case management supportive services piece lasts the entire Choice Neighborhoods grant term, which is anywhere from seven to nine years. Um, and residents are tracked uh, for at least five years after an initial move. So residents are relocated. Now you've got new units coming online. What happens with that right to return? Um, any new units need to be offered to those original residents that were on site the day of that Choice Neighborhoods Award up to relocation first. Uh, they can't be offered to any other household until all of those returning residents have that first right of refusal at initial lease up. Choice Neighborhoods does also allow for split households. And if there is a split, the original household has that initial uh, first right of refusal. Once all the original households are, uh, that ask is made, then the, the next head of household from the split would be at the top of the wait list or next in line to get that ask. Um, if a resident, let's say phase one comes online and a resident is not ready to return, um, they're set where they're at, they must again be offered a replacement unit in a future phase. So residents are retaining those rights every phase um, throughout. Residents also have a right to return even if uh, permanent assistance was offered through the URA. So that right is not lost so long as they remain lease compliant. Um, and again, residents are receiving services throughout. So there's a lot going on here. Um, it's all spelled out in the Choice Neighborhoods Program NOFO in that best practices document on the resources slide. But the bottom line is uh, residents are offered and entitled uh, URA benefits. And there's the expectation that there's a partnership with residents through case management, through mobility counseling to support them before, during, and after relocation so that they can make the choices best for their families, whether that's the new site, the voucher, other comparable housing. So I'll turn it over to Antonella. Thank you so much, Christina. 
Uh, as you folks are showing on the screen, we're showing you what are the resources available to you. Um, uh, the links are functioning correctly. We checked this morning. So once we you receive the slide deck, please be sure to check out all the resources that you have. Um, you know, just visit the SAC website. Uh, there are resources in section 18, section 22, RAD. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of questions regarding uh, some of these, specifically TBBs and HCV on the, the Q&A section. So we're going to get to those, but please, you know, just be mindful that you can also find a lot of answers to your questions by visiting these links and checking out these resources. So we're going to move to the questions part of today's session. It has been um, such a great presentation and we covered a lot and we have about 22 questions on the Q&A. So I'm going to stop share here so we can see all of our speakers. And I'm going to try to start with what I think would be the shorter answers. Uh, and then moving to, um, we have several questions on SBC. So first, let's stick to uh, right and return. So we talked a lot about that uh, in the context of uh, key considerations when it comes to residents. And we see here Nikki uh, Ratliff ask if the right to return is a right to return to the property or the project per se. Uh, can anyone clarify that for Nikki? Uh, what program was that, Antonella? So I, I think in general they did not add um extra information on on what program they were referring to specifically, but it was early on in the session, so um I'm gonna say Maybe. that we. Dominique, mm -hmm. you uh, address how that how Rad treats that. So this is for the. This is for the volunteer conversion question, correct? No, I think that they, they, they were just asking about if the right of return, maybe you could take it in the RAD context. Oh, to the, to the, yeah, so the right of return is to the covered property um, or project. Um, so you have a right to return back to the property itself, not the specific unit. I think I, I mentioned that before. Um, sorry, I just realized I'm not on camera. <laughs> Yeah, um, so you have a right to return back to the property itself. And then again, that's to an appropriately sized uh, unit for that household. So say prior to a conversion, you were living in a three bedroom um, because it was properly sized when you were initially assigned that unit. Um, but now, you know, you've had children that are gone through high school and moved out. And now it's now appropriate for you to be in a one bedroom instead of over housing you, you have the right to not be under house. Um, but as far as over housing, you need to allow that space for other people to allow them the ability to have affordable housing. Um, so you have a right to return back to an appropriately sized unit for your household at the time of moving back to the property. Okay. Maybe we want to clarify that if part of the RAD project involves a transfer of assistance, then the right is to return to the project with like wherever that assistance is going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the if the project site, the original project site is where the completed project is going to be, then the right to return would be the right to return back to that completed project. But if all of the assistance is going someplace else, then the right to return would be the right to transfer with that transfer of assistance to another property. Correct. Great, thank you. So I actually saw, it just came up, but it's related to this. Um, Another participant asks, the property is converted into RAD. If a resident signs a waiver to waive the right to return, do they still have a right to return to their property until completion? Um, so the right to return waiver is given to residents um, when there are, there are a couple different options. So there may be issues as far as um, being able to only have a temporary relocation. So say that, uh, you know, there's an issue as far as available units uh, during the construction process. So many PHAs 
will utilize um, vouchers and other alternative forms of housing options for the residents. Um, and the resident will be required to review and sign a, a waiver um, indicating whether or not they are relinquishing their right to return um, or if they are going to be accepting a alternative housing solution. Um, this is a hard question to answer. <laughs> and I could maybe add some language to that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to start by, by pointing out the fact that the URA prohibits waivers. You are not allowed to ask someone to waive their rights under the URA. They can choose not to accept some of what they're entitled to, but you may not request waivers under the URA. When it comes to waiving your right to return, that's a little bit different. When we talk about offering incentives or mm -hmm. alternative housing solutions so that you can complete a project the way that you want to complete it and in a way that doesn't trigger the URA because you're required to let them stay if they wanna stay. So they're allowed to stay, they're allowed to return, but you would really like them gone and they agree that they would like to be gone. Then offer their acceptance of those incentives or alternative housing solutions do typically come with the requirement that they give up their right, right to return to the project. Usually it's either or. If you're going to accept permanent relocation assistance, in most cases, that permanent relocation assistance would be in lieu of the right to return that you might otherwise have. So for instance, this often comes about if we have a rehab project that hits that 12 month mark, mm -hmm. They might be under a public housing program or a Section 8 program that has long-term assistance, and URA benefits only last for 42 months, unless we put them into another assisted program. But you don't have to under the URA, and we would like them to be able to retain those long-term subsidies. Yeah, I think that's the key here. Um, is retaining long-term affordability and long-term su subsidies to families that need it. So the requirement um, of a waiver would come into play there in the RAD um, transactions and RAD Section 18 blend transactions. Thank you so much to both. I believe uh, Jade, uh, I think her screen froze for me. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. move on to... <laughs> A question that I was actually directed to um, your part of the presentation, uh, Dominique, um, in the RAD Section 19 context, is the RAD information notice required to include or make explicit um, that RAD plans must be amended if existing residents uh, contest or comment that proposed plan would not allow or make it difficult uh, for them to exercise that RAD right to remain or return? Uh, for example, because there is um, a necessary bedroom size or accessibility features that are not being planned, or if the proposed building um, are mostly high rises, which are not allowed for families uh, without secretary waiver. Um, so if I mean, that's a loaded question, and um, just for reference, uh, someone submitted at around 135, if you want to scroll up in the yeah. section, but could you speak to that? Yeah, so I, I actually have that in front of me. Um, so I did see this question. So um, when you are giving the residents their resident information notice, the REN, um, at the outset of the application and RAD conversion process, there are certain highlights that you should focus on. We do actually have a sample REN notice um, located within our regulations and on our website. Um, so please do take a look at that um, as far as the language that we we recommend when um, informing residents of their rights uh, through the RAD conversion process. I would say it's important to highlight to residents um, and not only just give them, you know, whatever written requirements you're required to underneath our regulations, but also to fully explain what those mean. Um, so that includes explaining this whole process um, um, of whether or not 
residents can contest or the requirements of additional meeting requirements um, if a conversion plan is going to uh, directly impact a resident's ability to return back to the property. Great, thank you. And since I have you here, can you combine the REN and the GIN for a RAD project? Uh, we have seen it done. Um, so let me just, again, specify the, the REN. Um, that goes out to absolutely everybody participating in a RAD conversion. So that's the resident information notice. The GIN is only required if there is going to be relocation. Um, and the GINs are typically issued either um, at RCC or after RCC. So those are two separate periods of time and a lot of time can lapse in between that and a lot can change. Um, and plans for relocation can change a lot in between those two periods of time. So please keep them separate. <laughs> Got it. And related to that as well, someone else asked, in the RAD Section 19 context, where the displacement will be longer than 12 months or even if, shor even if shorter, exactly when does the right to return attach? Uh, they present a case uh, where many situations in which the residents are being offered transfers before the RCC issues and or the RAD notice of relocation or URA notice of eligibility is issued. Um, so could you talk about um, that specifically when it's not sufficient to issue a uh, URA uh, GIN and or RAD RIN for right, the, the right to return to kick in, correct? Uh, about what time was this, this question posted? 1.38. Perhaps it's already showing in the answered section because I accidentally. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so again, the only time transfers occur before RCC is if there is express permission from HUD that grants early relocation. No transfers or relocation of any type, permanent or temporary, should be occurring before RCC issuance um, and the effective date of the RCC. Um, and so the right to return back to the property is dependent on a case by case basis because of course it depends on whatever the the needs are of that specific household so if it's a a disabled household um and they have specific um they have specific needs for their disability that we had to address as a reasonable accommodation we need to ensure that the unit that we are offering them has those standards within that unit um, if it's just like a two or three bedroom unit and there's no additional specifications and we have the unit available and it's ready and it meets health and occupancy standards, that's when that unit would be ripe to offer a family on their right to return back to the property. So it's when the unit is, it meets health and safety standards um, and it is appropriate <laughs> for the family to move in an appropriate time. So we're not talking about, you know, at some date and time, you need to tell the family explicitly when they can be expected on the first day, they can be expected to be able to have access to that property. So it can't be like a date in the future. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to a question. Uh, very, very the very first question that we had submitted, um, I think this would be good for Jade to take on. So in the context of um, SBC, is TBB required to provide referral or identification of an actual available comparable dwelling? Um, and if this, I believe this is, if this is required, if TBB is issue subject to URA. Could you speak to that, Jade? If the URA applies, and again, that depends on if what is occurring is happening in conjunction with a, a federally assisted project that includes acquisition, rehab, or demolition. If that happens, then the URA applies, and the URA says that if you are offering a voucher as their comparable replacement housing offer, 
it must come with referral to a specific unit. If the URA doesn't apply, then my rules don't uh, aren't enforceable, but I remember hearing somebody talk about one of the other programs and saying, basically, we also still expect that if you're offering a voucher, you like under section 18, we're not going to let you demolish your units until you actually get those people housed. Right. That, yeah, just to piggyback on for the SAC programs, housing authorities are not required to identify a specific unit that section 18 doesn't require that, but they have to provide the necessary counseling to help the family find a unit and they can't complete the disposition or, or begin the demolition until um, the family is leased up. So in practice, that might mean helping in identifying um, one or more available units. And, that, and just that adding also, to the timeline of that, under the URA, you can't start, they're, they're entitled to 90 days notice before they have to move. And you don't start that 90 day time frame until you have offered comparable replacement housing. So you have to have an available unit for them to move into and use that voucher with before you can start the 90 day clock and, and require that they move out. And I'll just add on to that. That's also a requirement for the RAD program as well. You it's it's all fine and well to offer a resident a housing choice voucher as an alternative housing option. However, you cannot force that resident out of the property until they have identified an actual unit to move into and it has been approved. Great. Uh, thank you all. In uh, sticking to SBCs, um, were close out of the PHA's public housing program as a condition for approval. If a displaced household is over the TPB income level and there is no more public housing or alternative unit operated or assisted by the PHA, what happens to these families? Um, and I believe in parentheses they have said that this is an actual uh, anticipated situation. Right. So I, I addressed this briefly, but I'll go back. Um, um, if it's an over-income family and the housing authority has no available public housing units and can't offer HCV assistance, um, then the housing authority is required to offer um, the other kind of comparable housing described in um, Section 22 which is a uh, unit operated or assisted by the PHA at a comparable rental rate. Um, again, housing authorities have discretion here. They can, if, if the project will be used as housing after conversion, they can allow the family to stay in their unit um, as market rate or paying 30% of their income in rent um, for a, a reasonable mutually agreed upon time. Um, if the project will not be used as housing and the housing authority is vouchering everyone else out with vouchers, then um, the housing authority can help the family find a unit, again, paying all their relocation expenses and moving expenses. Um, and, and if that unit is not at the same or comparable rent as the public housing rent, then um, the housing authority should, again, um, reimburse or, or, or subsidize that rent for a reasonable amount of time. Great, thank you. Um, so for SBC that is not subject to URA protections, is there any other informational rights um, for example, notice about relocation besides the required 90 day notice to move uh, or displacement, which must be submitted with the application. Um, I think the participant is trying to assess if they understood that correctly. Yeah, um, again, the, the, the 52860 will require certain information about the housing authority's relocation plan. Um, and that, that includes, you know, the number of families who will be displaced, the, the kinds of comparable housing that Housing Authority plans to offer, the source of funds um, to pay for the relocation and moving expenses. Um, you know, again, the Housing Authorities can and 
probably are encouraged to submit a written relocation plan to the SAC as part of the um, conversion plan and application. But as long as you have the key information included somehow in that SAC DDA for voluntary conversion, um, you, you don't have to submit um, anything beyond that. I have seen a couple of questions coming our way about sort of further defining uh, certain terms that we have shared today. So one of them uh, was to please define impacted residents for the purposes of a Section 18 application. Uh, the specific question was, are impacted residents only the tenants of the property that is subject to the Section 18 app, or would that include anyone else? No, it would be the, the families who will be split, who will lose their public housing lease as a result of the Section 18 action. Okay, thank you. And I believe something else came in the chat. Uh, if you could define reasonable, um, I believe this is, uh, I'm not sure what this is related to. Um, about a three month reasonable amount of time. Oh, well, reasonable is also used as um, reasonable and actual relocation expenses. So if it, if that's where the um, person asking the question would like clarification, um, as I mentioned, reasonable and actual um, with reasonable there's PHA discretion there. Um, the example I gave was if the housing authority, if the resident wants to port out their voucher and move from Alabama to Hawaii, the housing authority might deem that relocation or moving expense not to be reasonable. Um, if the housing authority, uh, you know, they can offer to actually pay the mover directly or reimburse the family for packing up the boxes and paying the moving truck. And if the family finds a mover on their own, that's 10 times more than any other mover in the locality, the housing authority might deem that's not reasonable. Um, so again, it's it's PHA has some discretion there. Reasonable is not defined in any HUD regs or notices. Great, thank you. Kathy, I think um, they were specifically asking about the reasonable time frame for kind of providing housing subsidies if you have an over-income household, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I think the same answer applies. It doesn't define reasonable. It, it does make it challenging. I, I get that. I will say on the moving expense side of things for Section 18, you could look to URA guidance, which says that anything within 50 miles is considered to be reasonable for moving and anything beyond that is not considered reasonable. Right. And and on the length of time to subsidize, say, an over-income family's rent for a mutually agreed upon reasonable time, um, we've had some housing authorities follow URA and provide kind of a subsidized rent for 36 or 42 months or whatever the URA kind of periods there are. We've had some housing authorities um, follow the RAD phase in rent um, kind of um, thinking where they they start out at the public housing rent level and then gradually increase the rent um, similar to the, the, the phase in model of RAD. But again, these are just models to look to and those aren't required um, with section 18 or 22. Thank you. So switching gears here a little bit, um, we have a couple questions regarding uh, a house, a household that becomes split. Uh, if you could please, um, you know, clarify how uh, split households are handled, uh, considering the right to return. And um, I believe someone else also added whether they would have to go through a risk screening process, or if they would be exempt from uh, risk screening. So I can talk about this in the context of red. Um, so it, it does happen, um, and there is a lot of discretion given to the PHA um, on how exactly to handle it. So the right of return um, is retained with the head of household for RAD conversions. Um, so we do recognize that we do have blended families where, you know, you may have minor children, adult children, um, and they don't always agree with the decisions of the head of household on record on the lease. 
Um, a good example of this is recently we had a household that went through um, a rad conversion. They were relocated to a temporary relo uh, temporary location and the head of household decided to stay permanently. And the adult children wanted to return back to the property. Um, the PHA ultimately decided to um, give those adult children the, the right of first return. Um, again, that's with their discretion is not mandatory because as our regs state, um, the right of return is with the head of household, but you do have discretion um, in determining that and whether or not you want to allow units um, or persons who are not the head of household to return back and have the right of first return or if they need to go through the normal leasing process. I would just add and, and clarify for Choice Neighborhoods that similarly, the original uh, initial preference is for the original household. They have the right of return uh, as new units come online. Once all original households are offered a unit, if there are any additional remaining, then a PHA would be required to offer that new household a unit. And if there are none available, then that new second household would go to the top of the wait list and be accommodated. Great, thank you both. Um, I believe there is someone from another PHA asking, uh, perhaps this is also related to whether they have any flexibility in making these determinations. What happens when a resident is delinquent in their rent at the, type of, um, the, at the time of RAD conversion? Does that make, um, mean that the resident has the same right to remain uh, at the cover project as it converts and after the conversion to RAD? So the, the resident is still held to the lease terms and whatever house rules of the property during the conversion process. Um, so if it's pre-conversion uh, and they are delinquent and that is a violation of their lease term, the PHA has full authority to um, you know, seek whatever grievances or uh, violation notices or eviction um, based on their agreed upon lease and house rules. Great, thank you. Um, I did see something else, like a follow-up coming through the chat um, for the scenario that you um, talked about just a few seconds ago, Dominique. So uh, you explained about the adult children being given the right to return separate from the head of household. Um, would PHAs have to make such provisions in their admin plan? Or is that just something that goes through, you know, their... Uh, flexibility that does not have to be created in somewhere. Typically, that's on a case by case basis. It's not included in their in their plans. Okay, great, thank you. So, just moving up to um, the Q and A, going back to questions related to SBC. Uh, where a PHA plans to demo dispo after approval, but will reveal new residential units that are after with a private co-developer. Do the impacted public housing residents have a right to return, uh, remain to occupy the redeveloped residential units? Are they considered covered under the right to remain if the SBC results in continued use as residential dwellings? I can, I can take a shot at that and others chime in. Um, it, it's, it's really a case by case um, analysis. If at the time of DOT release and the conversion, assuming that involves like a disposition to a tax credit entity, if the residents aren't being um, provided, if, if the project won't immediately be used as housing, say, because it's gonna undergo a, a 12 month redevelopment period when it's vacant um, and the housing authority is, is issuing tenant based assistance to all those families to move off site. Um, at that point, those families are considered relocated under section 22 with tenant with off site tenant based assistance. Um, if the housing authority 
is willing and able to um, offer the families the ability to return to the project using project-based or tenant-based assistance, wonderful, but um, they don't have to. Um, the requirement to offer the families the ability to remain in place using tenant-based assistance is if the housing will be continued, continually used as housing um, at, at, at the time of conversion. Great, thank you. Um, we also receive a question, this is more on the TPV, TPV side. If a family relocates with a TPV and does not want to return to the renovated project with a PVV, um, does using a unit from our baseline count against the PVV program cap or is it still exempt since it is a replacement for a, a PHA unit? Right. Great question. Um, first, I will double down on, on the first part of that question, which is really a statement. If you issue, if the housing authority issues the family tenant based assistance to move off site at the time of a disposition um, and, uh, and and then offers the family the ability to return to the site and give up that tenant based assistance and return to the site as a to a PBV unit. Um, the family does not have to return. Um, that's up to the family. You can't require the family to give up that tenant-based assistance and return to the site using project-based assistance. So I think the, the the person who asked the question understood that, and, and but I did want to emphasize that. So getting to the actual question, if the, if the family decides not to return, um, certainly the housing authority can use as existing HCV resources in order to um, PBV um, the unit um, because they can't use the tenant basis of tenant protection voucher because the family doesn't want to come back. Um, and in terms of um, the exceptions that apply, um, I do know that it's the project that is, is, is has certain exceptions under HOTMA um, for the 20%. So if the actual project is um, project-based within five years of being operated as public housing, then the 20% caps don't apply. Um, it doesn't matter if those um, resources to PVV, the units came from TPVs or existing HCV. So I hope that answers the question. If not, um, put something in the chat. Great, thank you. And before we move on, uh, we only have about nine minutes left, uh, eight for today's session. Um, I did want to go back. Uh, we have talked about, about families that are, uh, or individuals that are over 80%. And I was wondering if one of you could briefly uh, go over any further assistance available for tenants that are over 80% uh, uh, unit operated or assisted by the PHA? I get to start because it's easy on my side. The URA protects all residents with relocation benefits regardless of income. If they are displaced and it's subject to the URA, if their housing costs are gonna go up, then we're gonna end up covering those increased costs for 42 months. And then to you, Kathy. Um, I think I covered this a couple times already. Um, a considerable discretion at the PHA level um, in terms of, of, of what to offer that over income family. Um, again, the comparable rental rate, no, no prescribed amount of time, unlike the URA. Um, so we just encourage you to have an open dialogue with these families. Some families choose decide they might want to do home ownership. And I've heard of some housing authorities that are actually have actually assisted those families in achieving home ownership as the form of comparable housing and maybe helped with a down payment. Again, a, a lot of housing authority discretion on what to offer those families um, based on, again, resident preferences and, and what the resident wants. Um, I guess the only other thing I can add here is that if you do offer the family the ability to stay in their unit, in, in their unit um, and exclude it from uh, the PBV half, if, if you are project basing the, the remaining units, um, you 
we recently issued a notice, well, not that recently, but it's 2020-19, and that allows an owner, uh, that provides that if an owner does offer a family a below market rent or other rent concessions, um, and that there's no TPV or HCV assistance in that unit, um, the unit can be excluded from rent reasonable. So that's another way that HUD is facilitating um, the ability to allow housing authorities to allow over income fee and families to stay in their units as, as comparable housing outside of a, a, of a HAP comp. And then just to chime in from the RAD perspective, I just want to reiterate um, that all residents who are legally at the property um, at or after the time of CHAP issuance have the right to return, regardless of whatever um, whatever their income is. So if they do not meet other funding programs, such as LIHTC, um, due to being over income for LIHTC, that does not disqualify them from being able to return back to the property. Again, they would still pay 30% of their income. If there are any um, differences in that amount, say they are already paying um, the, the cap rent um, as in public housing and then now they're post-conversion that cap rent has increased and that amount will then trigger an increase in their 30 percent payment um, that will be phased in over a period of three to five years so any of those increases are not immediate for that family we give them time to adjust Okay, I've seen a couple of follow-ups for this one. So I want to go back to Kathy. Um, for home ownership option to be available in the case that you were discussing, uh, would that be would that have to be included in the PHA plan? Or is yeah. that still part of the discretion? Well, the housing authority has to include in its PHA plan or a significant amendment, it's in, its intent to submit the home ownership plan to SAC. That was a question? I would assume so. Um, okay, so just to recap, if if they wanted to extend that home ownership option to the uh, family that does not want to necessarily return, then they would have to submit this. Oh, no, I, sorry, I misunderstood. So I think the context is you're offering the over income family assistance with purchasing a home as the form of um, comparable housing. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of discretion there. It's not, you know, the, the reg and the statute say you offer, you can offer families a, a comparable unit at a, uh, or a, a unit operated or assisted by the PHA at a comparable rent. So as the public housing program. So if that comparable rent is becoming the mortgage payment, you know, it gets, there's a lot of discretion there for, again, how, how the housing authority can help facilitate that. But I did hear about one housing authority where the over-income family wanted to leave public housing to purchase an offsite unit and the housing authority was paying their moving expenses there and also providing um, some reasonable amount of, of a down payment assistance or, or, or other assistance to, to help the housing authority be able to uh, pay the mortgage, um, a reasonable mortgage. Maybe it was comparable to the public housing rent. I'm not sure. Okay, got it. Um, I know that we've gotten more questions about this and I don't believe we're going to have the time necessarily to cover this today, but uh, we'll work in putting all your questions in a Q&A document uh, that would uh, potentially be also posted uh, with the rest of the materials so we can get to, to everyone. Uh, but be before we part, can one of you quickly talk about what is the role of the field offices in making sure that tenants actually receive what is legally required? I, I saw a good number of um, field offices joining uh, today's session, and I'm sure this would be relevant for them and under PHAs in the jurisdiction. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll start real quickly with Section 18. So with Section 18, field offices uh, can request that housing authorities provide um, some kind of evidence that all of the relocation requirements of Section 18 um, 
have or section 22 have been fulfilled and prior to releasing the dot um and allowing the the disposition to occur so they could say you know tell me that you've issued the 90 day notices provide some kind of evidence that all the families have actually been relocated so um so, so the field office does have leverage at that point to um ensure that the relocation requirements have been um um completed under the law before releasing the DOT. And then just to add to that, um, I think it's always uh, integral to have the cooperation um, and to be inclusive of the local field office in RAD transactions as well. They can become integral to the PHA and the developers, um, especially when it comes to early relocation and advising them on the steps to get early relocation approved. Um, and then if there are any updates at any point in time with the project plans, um, please work with your local field office and your transaction manager or your closing manager on the RAD team um, so that we can all be on board um, and up to date with any updates, especially if there are any technical assistance questions that need to be answered. All right, thank you so much. And we are right at time with still a good chunk of open questions. Um, but in respect of just everyone's schedules, uh, we're gonna close today's session. We will follow up uh, with a survey. Please make sure to uh, fill that out and we will share materials as soon as we have them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our speakers. Um, have a good day. Thank you, Antonella.